Hey everybody, welcome back. And I have a new little lab studio space that I'm working with. So it's been about two weeks since I collected those animals in the last video. And so today what I wanted to do is actually show you their progress, a little bit about how I put them into the tanks and what they're doing now. And on top of that, I also want to collect a little data on the sea urchins. So a little bit of science. Uh, it is the next day and it's time to sort of unbox the little uh, little quarantine tank. All right, I'm gonna start with the little arrowhead crab and it's been doing pretty well in here. Mostly hanging around all the calerpa I brought in. So I'm gonna kind of throw it in here. In the cup, you can kind of see I showed it to you guys yesterday. Here it is. <laughs> Looking good. So next are the little urchins, and there's a few of them um, that we caught. They're already starting to pick up things. Here we go, here's two of them. This little uh, kind of white looking variegated. This one is a little bit more kind of purple tipped. There it is. Um, kind of more greeny, this one. So the neat thing about um, urchins, you can see them as we put them in here, um, they are in what we call phylum echinodermata, uh, which actually means spiny skin, if you break down the Latin. Um, and you can definitely tell where that name comes from. Um, they are related to sea stars and sea cucumbers as well. Here's the kind of blonde one. Um, you can see all the little like little wavy things that are coming out here. These are little pedicellaria and little tube feet coming along. Um, the tube feet help it move along as well and the pedicellaria kind of help move things around their surface. Here's the little greeny looking one. I don't know if you can kind of see. Maybe when I get my hand out of the way. They are great algae eaters. They, they have essentially what we call a mouth part called a Aristotle's lantern. Here's sort of the purple tipped one. But essentially, it scrapes algae off of the rocks, and that's what they eat. Now, we're left with the little blue-legged hermit crabs that I brought in. There's the last one. All right, so we got about eight of them in this little cup. So I am going to put about three of them in the 20-gallon up here, and the rest are going to go in the 75. Go. One, two, three. And three. Here they go. And the nice thing about having these little hermit crabs in there is that they are great scavengers. Any food somebody else leaves behind, they're going to get. They'll also graze on some of the algae and keep that under control. So they're really good um, in terms of housekeeping. And here comes the goby. Uh, ready to <laughs> check them out. Hopefully it doesn't go after them. Sometimes they can be a little bit vicious. We'll see. It's mostly checking it out. Uh, it went okay. <laughs> it's like, is it food? If not, maybe I don't care so much. He's gonna check them all out. It's like, what's going on? There's little crabs in my house now. So it's two weeks later, and now we're gonna take a look at how the critters are doing now. And if you notice, I have a little bit of a new setup here. The uh, quarantine system has moved into the little lab studio room, and I've got a couple other tanks ready to go in the near future. The arrowhead crab is doing great. You can find it all over the rocks, generally picking on little bits of algae and things to eat. Here it is hanging out near one of the glass walls, and you can definitely find it navigating the tank all the time. This urchin is, has a piece of shell on top of it, and they often do that, putting little pieces to kind of help camouflage. And here's one of them on the glass, and you can actually see the mouth part called the Aristotle's Lantern actually scraping the glass looking for algae. It's a really awesome little mouth part to check out. 
And then her little hermit crabs are doing well in both tanks, crawling around, harvesting little bits of algae and detritus to eat. This one even found a new shell to get into a larger shell. So as you can see, everybody's doing really great, and I want to actually get into some data collection with some of the urchins. So now this came about because I had an observation out in the field, and that observation was most of these urchins were relatively small. Now in the past, when I've been in the same area, they've been much larger. Now specifically, I'm talking about the variegated urchins, that particular species that I was looking at. So my thought would be, why don't I take this cohort of sea urchins that I found and measure their growth rate over time? Now, I actually have five urchins now because I happened to have been out again and I grabbed one additional one, which is a little larger than the others. Either way, we are going to look at both the diameter and their mass. Now, when we're talking about diameter, I'm talking about a straight line segment that goes through the center of the circle. And we'll be measuring that using the metric system in millimeters. And then of course mass will be measuring in grams. So if we're going to collect data, we need some instruments to do so. And we're going to use two. So first off, I have a pair of calipers to help us measure the diameter. And to demonstrate this, this is a sea urchin test. Essentially it's what's left over after the urchin dies. It's its skeletal system. Now, I'm going to use this because we're going to demonstrate. I'm going to do the diameter by using these calipers, spreading them a little wider than the urchin. We're going to put the urchins right in there and then squeeze up the calipers and then it will give me a digital readout for the diameter, the distance between these two bars. Now the second measurement we're going to take is mass and we're going to use this handy dandy digital balance. And it is in grams. We're going to put a little tray on top of that. This tray happens to be 2.3 grams in mass. But the nice thing is, is this balance has a way to zero out the scale. So once I press that button, now that tray now weighs nothing. And that means I can put the urchin down on the tray without getting my balance all wet. All right, I have my handy dandy little science notebook here ready to go and it is time to get started. So we're going to start with the smallest of the urchins, little green. And so let's pull this one out. All right, pull the caliper through and let's see what we've got. There we go. And it looks like we are at 19.94 millimeters, 19.94 millimeters, 19.94. And let's see what the weight is. We are at 4.1 grams. Awesome. Now that's how we're doing it. So let's hit fast forward. And we did it! So now that we have all the data, let's check out the stats on each of the urchins. Based on this data, you can tell that there is a bit of a relationship between the size of the diameter and the mass. The larger the diameter, the more the mass, which makes logical sense. However, this is not a trend yet. This is one set of data from five urchins and we can't draw too many conclusions yet in this particular study. So why would we actually bother to know some of this type of information? Well, scientists look at invertebrates like this and measure growth rates to get an idea of essentially what's going on in an ecosystem. Because of course, if you grow, it's probably because you're healthy, you're eating, you're getting everything you need. If you're not growing, you might not and that growth rate might change for different species and different conditions and different variables. And so it allows us to get an idea of what's going on inside the ecosystem that we're studying. So we can check back on this in about a month and see what the progress of these particular urchins are. And of course, until next time, keep exploring.